Okay, I'm going to talk about some adaptations in the different systems of birds, uh, bodily systems that are the way they are because of their adaptation for flight. Birds are the only entire class of organisms that have this unique ability to fly. Some birds have secondarily lost their ability to fly, but a lot of how we understand birds and their structures is related to efficiency in flight. And so I'm going to walk through some adaptations in the different systems of birds for flight. And then in other videos, I may go into more depth into certain, certain of these systems. Okay, so when we first start to look at the design of a bird, we look at the skeletal system. So the general design of the skeletal system, um, there's some general themes. One is um, the birds have light hollow bones with struts and girders used to reinforce them and give them strength. And in general, if you look at the, the body of a bird, what you note is there is this centralization of mass in the skeletal system towards the center axis of the bird. And what we find is a reduction and fusion of bones at the extremities. And this allows for aerodynamic efficiency. So um, if we look at this, uh, uh, this bird skeleton a little more closely, um, some examples of this fusion and reduction in bones can be really seen in the forelimb of a bird. Um, bird forelimbs have many of the same bones or parts of bones that you would find in human forelimbs, but there's this extreme fusion and reduction of the bones um, with very short humerus, relatively short humerus, and then um, uh, elongated um, radius and ulna, and then a very elongated essentially wrist and reduction of the digits. Um, and so this reduction allows for a lightweight body structure. Um, and then what you have attached to these forelimbs are very light feathers. And we'll talk about, we've talked about feathers in a lot more detail in other, other sections. Um, you also see a fusion of the vertebral column. Many of the vertebrae are fused um, and there's a specialized um, fused structure in the area of the sacrum. The pelvic ca cavity has many fused um, bones. And you even see um, a reinforcement of the rib cage here with, you can see these individual ribs in the birds that are attached here to the sternum. And you have these small overlapping, what we call processes called uncinate processes that ha help to reinforce the rib cage. This is an important part of the, the body cavity. Um, another reduction in bones can be seen in the avian skull. Avians have very lightweight skulls, but in particular, they lack teeth. So um, tooth material, the bony material that makes up the teeth in a mammal is some of the densest material um, in the human body. And birds lack those teeth and that saves on weight. And instead they have a bill made of keratin. And so those are some major um, skeletal structures that are important. Some other features that are important to flight in birds uh, is the uh, fused clavicles. So birds all have clavicle bones that are fused. They form a structure called the furcula. You may know it as the wishbone. And this furcula um, provides um, some space, depending on the species, you might find some flat surfaces on this furcula for muscle attachment, and also provides um, a spring-like um, force that assists in flight. Probably one of the most noticeable things that you can see in this bird skeleton is the sternum. And the sternum is the place where the ribs attach. And we can feel our sternum on our front. It's very flat and it's fairly narrow. On a bird, the sternum is very broad and it is often, it is often deeply keeled. Okay, and so this keel is an, is an extension from the sternum, extends forward. And what this does is provide an extensive area for muscle attachment, specifically for the pectoralis muscles. Birds have really large pectoralis muscles. They account for between 10 and 35 percent of the total body weight of the bird, much less um, percentage-wise for, for humans. Okay, so those are some skeletal features. Here is an image of, a, of an avian bone. Um, here's a cross section. You can see these 
struts in the bone, um, but that they are hollow. So that, that this means the bones are lightweight, but yet reinforced for strength. Okay. Um, let's see if there's anything else I want to see talk about. Um, oh, the birds have a few post caudal vertebrae, not many, um, and they have a specialized structure. So these vertebrae past the pelvic girdle um, are fused to form a flat surface for the attachment of the rectrices or the tail feathers. This is called the pyostyle. Um, and just to note some of the fusion of the bones, like the tibiotarsus is a fusion of the tibius and some of the tarsi, tarsometatarsus. So the tarsi and the metatarsal bones are fused in the foot of birds. And we see a similar theme in, um, in the um, forelimb. Okay, so here are some um, adaptations in the muscular system of birds. Okay, I already mentioned the huge pectoralis muscles. That's probably the first thing you'll notice on, of, out of all the bird muscles that you observe are these really large breast muscles, the pectoralis muscles. The pectoralis muscles um, are important in the flight of birds. They're responsible for the downstroke, which keeps birds aloft and it helps them to get into the air. So these pectoralis muscles are really large. Um, another important um, opposing flight muscle is um, the supercoracoideus. And supercoracoideus, I don't think it's actually shown in this picture, at least it's not labeled. Um, actually, it attaches to the furcula, but then it threads up to, uh, threads up and attaches on the back side of the humerus, and it's responsible for the upstroke in birds. And for most birds, the supercoracoideus, it is a specialized muscle that allows, allows for flight efficiency. But for birds that are flying a lot in the air, the supercoracoideus does not have to be particularly strong. It is very important in the function of getting aloft. So having a strong upswing is important um, to getting um, up in the air from the ground. Um, and then for diving birds, diving birds can have really large supercoracoideus um, because the upswing and the downswing require a lot of muscle contraction um, in the dense um, nature of water, okay? Let's see if I have any interesting stats. Oh, so hummingbirds, for example, they have really large pectoralis muscles. But they also have a fairly large supercoracoideus because of the way they maneuver their wings in flight. Okay, so here um, is an image of the supercoracoideus. It does attach to the furcula, but it also attaches underneath the pectoralis to the sternum. Um, and you can see, so this is an image of the supercoracoideus. Most of that, or the, or the muscle mass, actually occurs on the ventral side of the body, but it's attached to this tendon that attaches to the back side of the humerus. So it's this unique structure with the tendon threading through the pectoral girdle um, to cause the opposing movement of the upswing during flight. Okay, and so here's a nice image of the supercoracoideus and the pectoralis muscles. And so here is a bird um, engaging in a downstroke. And you can see this pectoralis muscles are contracting. You can see that they attach to the ventral side of the humerus. And then the second image of the bird engaged in the upstroke is contracting the supercoracoideus. And when that contracts, it pulls because it attaches on the dorsal side of the humerus, it pulls the um, wing muscles up for the upstroke. Feathers. Feathers are a highly specialized feature found only on birds. They provide a number of functions and they have unique design. Feathers are also extremely tough and resilient and they're very light. And so the presence of feathers has been very important in the evolution of flight in birds. So there are a variety of different kinds of muscles, sorry, different kinds of feathers, um, but um, specifically important to flight are the flight feathers or the remiges, okay? And flight feathers tend to be asymmetric, especially the feathers that are um, uh, that are interacting with the wind or interacting with the air more. So the 
the outermost primaries on birds tend to be highly asymmetric, especially in birds that fly a lot. And this allows for some toughness and rigid, rigidity um, against the currents of air and also um, provides some strength here. And so here is a microscopic view of a feather. In, in previous weeks, we've learned about the different structures of the feather, but we have the central shaft, which is called the rachis, and then the vein, which some people would be inclined to call that central shaft, is actually the thing that looks like a leaf, the flat surface around the central rachis. Okay, so we have a rachis, and then each within the vein, you have this interlocking structure with barbs coming out from the rachis, and then another set of small um, feather structures called barbules coming out from the barbs. And there are different little features on the barbules that allow the feather to interlock. The, the hind portion of one um, barb is able to interlock with the fore section of another barb. And so here's some nice Im images of that overlapping design. The design is really similar to what you observe in Velcro that allows Velcro to stick together. Okay, um, so here uh, the, in the respiratory system of birds, um, there are some adaptations. Um, in particular, birds have one way airflow across the lungs. And so the lungs in birds are a bit different than what you find in humans. Um, humans have these balloon-like structures in the lungs. The lungs can contract and expand. We use our diaphragm muscle to expand the the air cage or the, the balloons of the lungs that they then fill with air. The body uptakes oxygen from that air and then releases the air. Now through a single breath of fresh air in a mammalian body, there is oxygen uptake, but a lot of the oxygen that is breathed in is also breathed out. And so there, the efficiency of oxygen uptake across a mammalian lung is not as high as you would find across the lung of a bird. That's because for every um, breath of air, that oxygenated air is actually within the system of the bird's respiratory system for a longer period of time, allowing for more efficient uptake. Um, and there's this series of air sacs. So they're, they're um, depicted here. Here's the trachea, and then it splits into the lungs. But along the way, you actually have a variety of air sacs through which the air flows and the air is always flowing across the surface of the lungs in one direction. And so for every breath of air that's taken in, the next breath that's breathed out is not that same breath. It's, it's a breath from previous breaths. So I'll show you in a reenactment in another video of this one-way airflow across the lungs. It's hard for a lot of people to, to understand, but it allows for much more efficient uptake of oxygen because that oxygenated air is able to spend more time across that surface of the lungs. Okay, here's another depiction of the um, air sac system in birds. Okay, in the circulatory system. Birds, uh, if you look at the relative proportions of different parts of their bodies, I mentioned that the pectoralis muscles are really huge um, compared with mammals. Um, with their circulatory system, birds have really large hearts. Um, uh, the heart of a human is about 0.4% of their body weight. In a sparrow, a sparrow's heart cons comprises about 1.7% of their body weight, and then 2.4% in the hummingbird. So the relative size of the heart and the body systems is much larger in a bird. And so this, this heart is responsible for fueling their um, system, that the high energy, high metabolic demands that are needed and require the high oxygen uptake that's required for flight for, the, for their high metabolic rates, okay? Um, also in the circulatory system, um, the red blood cells that you find in birds are much smaller in size um, than you find in re other reptiles. So birds, unlike mammals, have nucleated red blood cells. Now, nucleated red blood cells are less efficient at, up, at oxygen uptake 
because that loss of a nucleus in the mammalian blood cell creates a larger surface area for oxygen uptake. And so this is how mammals are able to efficiently uptake oxygen to fuel their metabolisms. But in birds, they didn't lose that uh, nucleus in the red blood cell, but what we find instead are much smaller red blood cells. And so this compensates for that surface area loss and that there are many more red blood cells available for this oxygen uptake. Birds have really high metabolic rates. So your, the average body temperature of a bird is about 104 degrees, okay? And much higher body temperatures than that, and you start to see enzymes and DNA and other important molecular structures within a body start to denature. So birds really truly are living at the metabolic edge of what's possible in humans, in, in um, living systems. Uh, now we're looking at the digestive system. So uh, some adaptations in the digestive system of birds are, one, that they don't have teeth. And so that saves a lot of weight in an extremity that's far away from the central axis of the body. So the bird has this very light bill instead. The downside is the bill can be used for some food manipulation and, um, and, and modification, but not as well as teeth. Teeth are really good at grinding and cutting. Um, birds have specialized bills for tearing at flesh and for certain other like seed crushing, but um, most of that kind of manipulation of the food, the mushing of the food, happens in a specialized structure within the digestive system called the gizzard. The gizzard is a really specialized muscular structure and it's responsible for grinding up food particles. Birds will swallow small amounts of gravel um, and hard material and that sort of forms that the, serves the purpose of the tooth. So you have these hard grains of gravel within that muscular structure that's contracting, and that helps to crush up the, the food. Birds also have fairly simple, simple digestive systems for the most part. Okay, there's one species of, there's a few species of bird that eat veg, vegetation primarily, but not many live on a diet purely, diet purely of vegetation. Most birds have really rapid digestion and they either eat insects or high protein food items or they're eating high energy food items like fruits, nectar, or seeds. And they have really rapid digestion as anyone who has parked their car under a roosting colony of starlings would know. So they have, um, uh, they can eat food and digest it very rapidly and emit waste very rapidly. In the excretory system of birds, there are some adaptations as well. Um, birds have no urinary bladder. So they have no means of storing um, uric acid, which is the way that they produce the type of waste that they produce rather than urea. So they, as soon as they produce weights, they emit it, they excrete it, and that saves weight. They do excrete uric acid rather than urea which requires less water to excrete the waste. And so um, the mammalian kidney um, functions differently to the reptilian kidney. And so this excretion of uric acid rather than urea that we find in mammals is actually a deep split between the land vertebrates that became mammals and the land vertebrates that became reptiles, including birds, crocodilians, turtles, lizards, snakes, that all excrete uric acid. It's a slightly more complicated process to generate uric acid, but it requires less water. And so the intake of water has to be, is lower and um, the amount of water held in the body to go, take through this process is lower and so that re reduces weight. Birds also have seasonal regression of their gonads. And so during the breeding season, the, um, the ovaries will develop eggs and release eggs and they become much more enlarged. But in particular, avian testes are almost um, invisible during the non-breeding season, but they become very enlarged during the breeding season. And so they, they, um, they, that functions to save weight during a time of year, usually where resources are less available and energy needs to be conserved and that saved weight that weight reduction saves some energy for the bird. 
birds do not have any, there are no birds that give live birth. So if you look in the world of reptiles and fish and even mammals, um, you have some variation in egg laying versus live births. And, um, but within birds, there are no birds that, that give live birth. And so all birds lay eggs. And this is another form of weight redu reduction that leads to certain ecological and biological differences in the bird social systems that we'll see and talk about in, in other sections. Okay, those are, that's an overview of some of the adaptations of birds. There will be other videos that go into more depth into some of these systems.